Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be looking at uh, the Hitchcock Truffaut of comics, Jimmy. Eisner Miller, a conversation. Book published by Dark Horse Comics in the aughts, the, the early 2000s. But before we do that, I want to invite you guys to like, subscribe, and follow to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon so that you can mitigate the Kayfabe effect. When we talk about such books like this, a lot of people go out, run and get the books, uh, dissolve them off of eBay and Amazon. And if you have that uh, bell icon hit, you get first dibs at the videos, you get first dibs at scooping these books up, and uh, without further ado, Jimmy, why don't we just like crack this thing open? Let's do it. And uh, check this stuff out. Eisner Miller, one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, 30 parts, and I th figure like uh, these are two kind of important creators in the history of comics, having a, having a f candid discussion in the era where people didn't take it personally, if you... Uh, had some disagreements while having conversations. So uh, I figured, like, uh, what if we go into, like, five parts an episode or something like that? Because uh, these are chock full. It's chock full of, of information. Yeah, and uh, I should say recorded 2002. Yes. Um, Eisner dies in 2005, so, you know, obviously near the end of his life. I love how lucid he is. Apparently all the way to the end, you know, like yeah. I, I can't remember the name of his last book, but I remember picking it up and being stunned by how sharp the inking was, you know, like it doesn't seem like he loses any of his faculty at any point. And, uh, and it, it makes, it gives me hope yeah. for my own future. I think, I think he's even working on that, on that book while, uh, participating in this conversation. I do wonder how long these sets of discussions went on, uh, because there's talk of being picked up at the airport and yeah. stuff. So, so. Frank packed a bag yes. and spent a little time down there in Florida with Eisner. This is this is uh, Eisner's backyard, and I'm just taking a look. I'm looking at a really nice in-ground pool that I don't think Eisner's probably using very much with, like, a fenced-in area, man, to keep those leaves out. Keep the bugs out. It's, uh, it's screened in. It's a, it's a little bit. It looks more fenced there than screen, but uh, this is something I see all the time when I visit my in-laws in Florida. And uh, pretty common. I think if you have a pool there, you pretty much have to have it enclosed. Yeah. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Jim Rugg and Ed Piscor are lifelong cartoonists with a heck of a bibliography. And March is Cartoonist Kayfabe Month at the comic shops. Jim Rugg is going to be presenting you, Hulk Grand Design Monster, at the end of March. And Ed Piscor is going to be bringing you uh, Red Room Trigger Warnings issue number one um, on March 9th. High Octane, Incredible Hulk comics distilling down the history of the Incredible Hulk into two solid 40-page comics coming month after month. Uh, this will be coming out in April, Inc Incredible Hulk Grand Design Madness. These are the variant covers to go along with Hulk Grand Design. Uh, the first run, the Ed Piscor, the Marcos Martin, the Peach Momoko. Got this uh, Jeff Darrow cover that's going to come with the second issue. And Jim, you've yet to, to print me up uh, the Ed McGinnis Variant cover that's coming up with that next one. Coming soon. <laughs> Red Room Trigger Warnings, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Uh, first issue coming out, like I said, March 9th. And these are the additional covers uh, to go along with that. The Jim Rugg, By Way of Robert Crumb, Peach Momoko, and the Eddie P variant. Going to be coming out on a monthly basis, completely self-contained. And uh, Rising Tide Raises All Ships. And we have other books in print at the moment. The Breast of Jim's Bibliography that you could get on Amazon or at a good comic shop today. Plain Jane's Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, collecting all of his uh, image comics uh, versions of Street Angel. We have new printings of Hip Hop Family Tree that are out in the wild, the box sets and individual issues, so they are no longer $200 on eBay and Amazon any, anymore. WYSIWYG, still in print, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, get your hands on that. And the grand design that started them all, X-Men Grand Design, three volumes of that that you can get easily at uh, any good comic shop or on Amazon. And there is also an omnibus that is out of print, uh, but you might be able to find it in the wild here and there. I was out at the flea market recently, saw a copy. Now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. Stagnant mosquito water. Intent is uh, the, fir the first part of this. And Miller and Eisenman talking about what their intention is uh, with comics. Uh, this is the stuff where Eisner gets into trouble a little bit at times because he gets very highfalutin with uh what his ideas of like his comics are and things and you read his comics i'm a big fan of his comics like i'm not a part of the peanut gallery that just dumps on him but it's melodrama man and 
and uh, wh- what is uh, what is melodrama but uh, real life with all the boring parts cut out? Yeah, he talks about uh, man's relationship to God, and Eisner talks about this and uh, the idea that he and Miller are talking to two different audiences. Yes, and he describes Miller as being much more sort of contemporary in his storytelling, and Eisner much more sort of reflecting on the past in his storytelling. Um, something that uh, he's conscious people criticize him for, including calling out editor Diana Schutz, who beats him in the head because uh, says I ought to stop telling those stories and expose myself, <laughs> you know, do more contemporary stuff. And Miller talks about he likes that pop culture part, that comics are part of the uh, contemporary culture and uh, compares it to music and things like that in terms of being contemporary and something that people can talk about. The back and forth at this part, though, it, it does it does make me think about like the stuff that you would hear from comedians when they were uh, in conversations with like Bill Cosby at the time, where if like you said one swear word or something, like he would dump on you yeah. and cause you all kinds of trouble. Like you see Eddie Murphy had that, and clearly Hannibal Burris uh, had those conversations with the dude. Uh, everybody would talk about that, and Eisner is completely kind of sunning. Uh, Frank Miller and it's just like oh well you know your 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 comics are like I'm concerned with man's relationship to God and and you're interested in like I got to kill this guy because <laughs> and even Frank Miller defends himself like I think that that's a that's a mischaracterization an unfair mischaracterization like there's way more to my comics blah 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 I don't want to I don't want to pontificate and say that uh, you know there's some super deep meaning but there's more to it than just killing. Yeah, it does feel like they stake their ground. Uh, Eisner, as you say, being melodrama. Uh, Miller brings up romance. And we've done some Miller interviews in the past. And uh, that was something that he hit on back around, you know, in the mid-80s, around Dark Knight Returns time. And he's hitting it again here. The other thing that is mentioned in this is uh, A Family Matter, the Sin City yeah. original graphic novel. And it's going to be discussed more as we go along. It must have been done recently, you know, around the, before the time of this interview. But it's interesting to me because... As Miller gets into that and the experience of making that, it's an original graphic novel and there's some thrill involved. You know, like he makes the whole thing before he shows it to anybody, for example, and that, that's very exciting to him. I was trying to think of his catalog. I think that's the only time he's done an, an original graphic novel. I do think that things were kind of parsed out to his discretion, though. So, like, I do, yeah, there's that, there's, there's Holy Terror. That, that oh, came yeah, out yeah, as like I guess that, that's right. A, that would an, a, an original piece. But um, he started to become less and less precious about thinking about page count. So, like, I think it's the final issue of Sin City, like the first one with Marv, where there, it's not an anthology, that issue of Dark yeah. Horse Presents is not an anthology comic. You know, it's it's oversized because he just took as many pages as he needed to put the comic together. And that's a little bit of what he's saying about a family matter here is just like, it's also the first time he didn't think about conscious, like, like a page count. He let the thing breathe as he wanted to. And that actually like dovetails perfectly into the format part of the discussion. By the way, it dovetails into today. Absolutely. Um, you know, like, like this is a conversation I'm interested in having with a lot of the guests that we come on that are making comics and talking to them about what they see in terms of that format stuff. It's still a conversation that's happening. So kind of cool that, you know, 2002, it's on Miller's mind, but here we are 20 years later, and it's like, it's still topical. Like, like we're going to talk about this more today with people. So, you know, it's it's definitely um, an interesting concept, and I think it applies to other things, too, like web comics. You know, it's not just graphic novels, and you can have unlimited pages, or at least more than 22. It's it's a lot of the way comics are built today. I mean, we're sitting here in a room, like, like the things he's talking about, the things that he's wishing for have come to fruition. Uh, he's He simply is like, let let these books mir- mirror like the the subject matter like let let these books breathe and, and be what they want to be don't stay bound by my, mylar bags and long boxes he, and he talks about I just abhorring that format let me read an excerpt yeah <laughs> the pamphlet stinks so much the periodical nature of comics is so wrong it's not just that it's bad for commerce it's terrible for the art too there it is man it's uh he is going hard against the comic book format and uh, it's really fun to read this stuff to me to, to, to get that perspective. And a lot of it I agree with, not all of it. But, you know, he says one of his criticisms that I think is interesting and I don't hear much. People have to make the stuff too dense to make it worth $2.50. You know, when comics start and they're 10 cents, it makes sense. Like, yeah. it's, it's cost effective. But we've gone away from that medium or that format, rather, in terms of it being the cheapest way to make this stuff or to sell it to kids. So you've, you've changed your audiences and you've changed your price point but we're still stuck in this format where it's like, 
well, if you want to get your money's worth, and I mean, what's a comic today? Four or five dollars for yeah. those 20 pages? You do have to, you do feel pressure to put a certain amount of content in those 20 pages, and the page count isn't getting bigger, therefore it's like more and more information on that page. And I don't know, man, the way we live and consume stuff, it's on a screen, a small screen now. So that kind of density, I find it jarring. Sometimes the comics that we reread, you know, like Claremont X-Men, I go back and read those and it's like, it feels like a graphic novel or or maybe a tedious (laughs) version of a graphic (laughs) novel sometimes, but it does feel like there's a density there that is not my choice. Mm Mm-hmm. Eisner, I mean, uh, Miller is talking about at points that he's ch- what he's chasing with the type of comics that he wants to make somewhere between American comics and manga. He wants mm-hmm. big pictures. And I, the format thing, it makes me think about like early days of Viz. Like Viz did not become the Viz that they are today before they really started putting their their stake in, in graphic novels. Yes. And for anybody unfamiliar with where Viz is today, they're the number one graphic novel comics publisher in the United States. Absolutely. So, like like by a wide and far margin. Right. Like maybe put DC and Marvel together and I don't think that you even hit Viz numbers. Uh but in those nineties, when they were trying to mimic the American format rather than just sticking with what worked over there in the land of the rising sun, a three dollar issue of Lum can be read in five minutes and we are just not used to that like exactly. there's there's that whole thing like this perceived value thing like you know you crack open this iphone that we're shooting this video on and there are heat sinks in there that do not need to be in there but they just make it weigh a little bit more because you're paying a thousand dollars for yes. this phone psychological and that's a little bit of the stuff that they're getting into when they talk about format too both of them are in agreement that it that arriving at the comic book format is a, just was a weird mistake because even when you fold the newspaper two times, you're still cutting three inches off the yes. top. Like three <laughs> inches at the, off the top are just being thrown away. Yeah, it's an amazing volume when you think of like, this is a time when books are, comic books are selling a million copies. <laughs> like those three inches are not three inches. They are miles. All they right. are several more books, uh, but they're just, just being wasted, as you say. It's cool to, to see them come at, because they're both interested in different formats, but they're coming from different directions. Miller's really on that widescreen kick, which follows 300, if you're not familiar. It is spreads, 300, and then when it was collected, those spreads became a page. So it's like a very wide, um, almost the way you see newspaper strips often collected. Sure. So horizontally wider than it is vertical. Eisner's into like six by nine inch books, and they talk about... Uh, Miller's interpretation of that is Eisner is coming from a literary background and that six by nine is a more intimate reading experience. You know, you got to look at it a little bit closer. It's small, but it's really like reading a book. Yes. And Eisner doesn't disagree. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I haven't heard that laid out uh, quite that way. You know, the idea of like, what is a six by nine inch book in terms of a relationship to a reader? And it is different than a big oversized 300. Eisner does does have that, that stink on him of... of trying to be something more than what comics is or something like so he's he's chasing you know the adult reader like there's talk about like the inefficiency of the balloon and how that immediately makes people think of childish comics yada yada um there's some cool name checking that happens in here too like when miller's at this is actually very telling actually he's he's at the airport i guess maybe even on the way to to florida and he sees charles burns black hole in there and it's like oh i'll grab that but then it's it's, you know, 500 pages. It, it doesn't fit in your laptop bag or whatever. It's unwieldy for, for that kind of experience. So now, like, page density comes into the conversation at least a little bit because it's about scale and page count. You know, like, I'm reading my complete Uber Alice Stray Bullets right now, and that's a, that's a heck of a tome. Yeah, we should look at some of these omnibuses at some point from a design standpoint, because I actually think that Stray Bullets one is a good collection because it's it's kind of floppy. Mm-hmm. You know, you can actually open that even though it's a thousand pages and read it, but sometimes that's not always the case. That is true. And and also there are considerations for where the image area, the image area changes depending on what page it is in that big book. You have to continue pushing the artwork mm-hmm. out further and further to the edges, and sometimes they don't do that. It's real dumb. 
and they're very clear talking about like this does go back just to history. It you know, does. This format is this legacy thing that we don't think about much, and quite honestly, I think that continues today. I love comic books, but they are definitely for me part of it is this nostalgic object. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's everybody's default whenever we think of what is a comic book or why does it look like that. I don't know that people sit around and think about it that way. Right. So it is a it's a good conversation to have and one that uh, I do think everybody almost producing comics has had at this point over the next 20, you know, the 20 years since Miller and Eisner said this. Color comes into the conversation yes. here uh, in mm -hmm. the format area of their discussion and uh, both have interesting treatments, you know, like Miller lets Lynn Varley go ham on his stuff and provides no direction, uh, at least at this time, provides no direction, lets her do her thing, man. Uh, so he, he even describes her as the cinematographer. He's like, I'm essentially the director, but I'm sure as hell not the cin cinematographer because things are like uh, temperature and mood and location, he leaves that all up to her. I see a smile on your face, man. Are you looking at this little piece right here in italics? I'll read that. Yeah, please. Uh, most comic books are kind of brown now, ever since computers came in. Jimmy, you never read this before, huh? <laughs> this right? is my first time. Yeah, it's amazing. It is, uh, it is spot on. I love all of this talk with color. I think it's, it's, it's exactly there. And I find this stuff fantastic yeah. in that these guys are definitely talking about and looking at comics a little differently than even an interview with one of them. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are two. This is Senpai Kohai, uh, Inside Baseball Talk. So happy that this is recorded. Uh, you, you know, know he also posterity. says color's such a powerful arsenal, and uh, it's not. It's it's really not used much in our field with purpose. I mean, I feel that that's still true. And totally. you know, some of that is ninety percent of anything's garbage, right? Isn't that the the right? There's some famous quote that's similar to that. I'm paraphrasing. And so inevitably, if you go to a wall of new comics, most of them, half of them, are below average. Right. You know, this is just math. And I, I think that uh, I think it's still true. Once again, another great opportunity to, to name check some heads, right? Like you got uh, Frank Miller talking about Mazzucchelli, Chris Ware, Dan Klaus, uh, who obviously care about the color of their of their comics. Uh, around this time, you had you had some some rising stars of computer color. Uh, Matt Hollingsworth to me is like one of the the mm -hmm. greatest professional comics colorists uh, in, in in the game. Who 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 cares about that stuff? You could take a look at different books, and he creates different moods for different projects. Like such a bad badass. I, uh, I Greg Smallwood is doing Human Target, and I just got a glimpse of that recently. And he's coloring and drawing it himself. That's one that pops. So there are definitely examples out there of really exciting color. And I think more people are conscious of it, but it's still, man, color. You could spend your whole life studying color and still still be something of an amateur with it. So uh, it is complex. It's smart of Miller to find somebody like Lynn Varley and like let this huge piece of the puzzle be solved by somebody who has been you know, practicing this for, for decades. And uh, Eisner's contribution to, to this part of the conversation is... Uh He's. This is where he's like, you know, the Hitchcock, uh, the silent movies or true cinema. Eisner's like, fuck color. Like, color's just a, a sales mechanism to, yeah. to me. Commercial. Uh, yeah. Marketing tool, he calls it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with him. Yeah, he talks about uh, splash pages, too, and this idea of, like, how hard you're trying to sell these books. And then he makes a comparison. If you're John Updike and you sit down and write a book, you're not thinking, will this be in Bodoni or will it be in Cheltenham? Two different typefaces. And uh, it kind of makes me laugh because I feel like this is the kind of nerdy inside baseball talk that I have with other cartoonists. Jimmy? The stuff that I think of is borderline inconsequential to a reader as long as it's not a fail. All I'm saying, man, is that whenever we go to conventions and we, we share our new books with uh, fellow professionals, it isn't that far different <laughs> than that scene in American Psycho when everybody's yes. showing off their, their bone-colored totally. business cards. <laughs> That's so funny. Dan Klaus, you motherfucker, you could print inside your box set. I'm going <laughs> to smack you in the head with an axe. Not really, Dan. That's so good. So true. So, yeah, if you don't use color for purpose, why waste the ink? And uh, that's a great thing, man. Write this on a big piece of paper and put it above your drawing table or your computer station wherever you're making comics. I think that's good advice. There, I, like I was, I was nominated for for best colorist one time uh, for the the Eisners, and everybody else was a cartoonist except for Dave Stewart, who maybe there was a Hellboy that came out or something. And the colorists of comics were very upset because the argument was 
volume uh, in a lot of ways. I color 500 <laughs> pages a year, and these people just color 30. Like, fuck that. There was other arguments of like, this is the only award that we could ever be nominated for, and they could be nominated for other things. But there's something about when you put your own name on a comic and you and you don't have a safety net of a bunch of other people on the assembly line you put a lot of consideration into the you way do, this stuff and looks. And you have the advantage of, like, you had the story in your head. Like, you know what this scene's going for in a way that, yes, colorists try to do that and some of them nail it, but you've got an advantage if you're the, the creator. We're going to get into lettering talk soon, yeah. and it's the same deal. Like, if you're the one person doing it all, every element can, can really support whatever it is you're trying to say. The walk through the rain. This is a fantastic little little segment because... You think about the rain in Sin City. You think about that rain scene in A Contract with God. We point out rain in a lot of comics <laughs> we look at. It feels like it's a rite of passage for uh, North American comics, at least. Look at look at this. It's phenomenal. A little bit of talk there about uh, printing Contract and God in sepia. Yes. Um, pretty interesting s stuff there, you know, making it stand out a little bit. And then we get into the lettering. But the fact that uh, before that, I think before that it, like Eisner's talking about like I made this book on spec which I think is incredibly fantastic ambitious uh the belief in oneself is amazing uh thinking about that there were there were precedent like like we 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 did a great video with Warren Bernard where he's showing stuff off by Jules Pfeiffer that came out before that uh well Eisner worked with Jules Pfeiffer so you know like there's a little kayfabe uh to a certain extent, but these kind of books were made be before A Contract with God. Eisner had such a big career. He was probably going to sell it, but he did do it on spec. He didn't have a contract, and I do think that that is no noteworthy. These guys are talking about... Can I add to that? Yeah. He mentions earlier, like, he was saying 300, he, he considers it a book, not yeah. a comic. And, of course, the guy who credited as being, like, you know, the inventor of the graphic novel is really into these terms. Like, when I read that, I think about, like, the conversations we've had at conventions where people are arguing over it's comics, it's graphic novels, it's this or that. I don't care. Yeah. Like if if I as long as I understand what you're referring to, I'm good. But you can see why Eisner is so, you know. I mean, even talking about marketing, like that's what those terms really are. Yeah. As far as I can understand them, and you can see how in tune Eisner is with that. And you know, when you're doing a big project on spec, you kind of have to be in tune with that. Is this sellable? You know, right. what am I actually making here? You know. Yeah. Because we've seen that. We've seen brilliant artists make stuff that it's just, that's great. That's amazing. You cannot sell that. This is kind of a, a part where uh, I, uh, where Miller talks about making that um, that Family Matters book sort of without the tether of editorial and stuff. And hitting a stage where he didn't know if it made any sense, mm -hmm. Eisner concurred, and that made me feel good. Yeah. You know, that made me feel feel great. One thing that did not make me feel good uh, in this conversation is when Eisner says, yeah, you know, I, I put a chunk of time uh, to the side to, like, make a contract with God, and it was, like, six months that could have been washed away. And and then Miller's talking about, like, I made this family uh, values uh, book, and, you know, that was, like, five or six months. And I'm like, these are 120 yeah. pages. <laughs> like, like, I need to step up my game. But then I start thinking about... Uh, Eisner's been in the game since the invention of the comic book, and Miller's been in the game at this point for like 30 years, so maybe when you hit 30, you could draw a little quicker or something. But that was a very humbling, those are very humbling numbers to read. Let's talk about lettering. Yeah, Eisner talks a lot about trying to figure out lettering for a new medium, or for a new format that he's targeting like older readers, and how do you do that? Because they're talking about like the big letters on that on that opening page in the rain, and uh, it just goes to show, like, these elements need to be considered. Yeah. That that would be my biggest takeaway from it. And we're going to see some examples of different approaches to lettering throughout here. But it's just, it's vital. Yes. Talks about typesetting, you know. And, and uh, it could be the same arguments that we have with, with frankly, computer, computer lettering. Uh, is it divorced from the page? Like, is it creating something, like a disparity between the artwork and, and, and the text? And... Are there approaches that you could do to, to like, get that to work? Uh, Eisner, Eisner did do some of that. You know, we'll see a couple pages here and there. Dude, look at this badass shit, dude, where it's hand lettering in perspective. Yes. And behind, behind that, going behind that sign. Right. So you still got to be able to read what the words are. That's really good stuff.
You know what's fun is like, uh, I talk about lettering a lot, love lettering. You see these kind of like headlines, you know, on scraps of paper. I think about Watchmen. Mm -hmm. There's so much incidental lettering in that comic where it's like a headline on a newspaper on a desk or Big. a sign, you know, whenever they're going into like Dr. Manhattan's military facility or something like that. Uh, it's really kind of cool to think like this stuff does go back. Yeah. There's a long tradition of that. Yeah, Eisner absolutely is mentioned as being an influence. And when you have situations, like, these are de facto captions. It's not, like, expository in the way that you're used to with, like, a Stan Lee comic or something. But that's a caption. It's, it's, it's telling you some story information. Man, and we get into some cool shit here. So, talking about, like, uh, what to do with word balloons. Yes. You know, and, and they bring up Barnaby, which was uh, like a mid-20th century comic strip that used Futura as, you know, as typeset uh, and how that stood out, you know, because like, I see so many cartoonists complain about word balloons. I think Chris Ware has, has, has uh, talked about that in interviews and stuff. And I just don't understand it. Like to me, it's one of those things that is part of the comics language and it's been handled in so many ways. Like I can point to lots of examples where I go, that's good looking or that fits the art or that tells the story. And yet, other people just re you know really reject that form for some reason. And it could be if you're into the history of comics, like you see the struggles of figuring out word integration in those early, early comics. But to me, I feel like it's not a problem. But Eisner is expressing it's a problem, and how do you manage that? Uh, it talks about how Foster. He was wrong. Hal Foster was wrong. Yeah, that's Frank Miller <laughs> saying that. But Eisner's like, Hal Foster was Hal Foster. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And I've seen interesting uh, uses of the Hal Foster approach and, and stuff like even like Rubber Crumb uh, would, would do comic. We've seen pages of, of Ghost World that had, you know, the voluminous caption up top with the image underneath with no word balloons or anything like you. It could be done. Yeah, definitely. They, they, they get into like the balloons and, and people trying different stuff. Kyle Baker's a guy I'd point at because yeah. he doesn't just do um, like narration for his captions that are word balloon free. He'll do dialogue. Yeah. And it's just physically placed in proximity to the character that's speaking. And he's done graphic novels like that. And I don't think there's any problem with that. I, I think it's easy to read and follow and looks fine. When they, when Eisner brings up the, the Trinity of like Kniff, uh, how Foster, Alex Raymond and how, at this stage of comic strips in the early 20th century, um, the sales mechanism really was the visuals, the art. And that sort of coincides with just the sort of gutter nature of the medium of what people think of as comics because the superficiality of the visuals was most important for so long. There would be outliers like, like Harriman and things like that, but like the visuals were, were, were almost everything. Little Al Cap talk. Little, yeah, Al, Al Cap, they talk about how, like, all his characters are yelling. Yeah. <laughs> Very big lettering. <laughs> that's that's pretty fun, and you can see the example here on screen. Um, talk about Harvey Kurtzman and how, you know, like, EC was mechanical typeset style lettering. Well, not typeset, but mechanical, and how he got away from it. He Kurtzman. did, he did, but then he went to type He went to yes, he typesetting with, with Humbug right? and Help and... Uh, you know, like other comics in the future. Kind of neat to think about Kurtzman, this very thoughtful cartoonist. And if you flip the page, you'll see uh, some example of his typesetting. I think that's, is that Humbug era? Uh, this Goodman is, Bieber? Yeah, uh, I think it's in Help. Yeah, 60s is Help. Okay. Um, these are the, like this, you're getting a C in Will Eisner's class, man, if you have what he calls the umbilical <laughs> dialogue bubble, because his, his whole thesis is like, a panel is a moment in time. But when you have... A flowing conversation. Now you're you're disrupting the format. You're disrupting the medium by by doing this kind of thing. And there was just very little space for these Goodman Beaver stories, man. That like it sort of had to be done that way. I don't mind that either. It's easy to read, and that art is so tight, it's almost mechanical. Yeah, I feel like those actually fit together fairly well visually. Well, yeah, sure, but and it's not the typesetting. It's it's oh it's, yeah, the umbilical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> right. That's that's what. It gets him salty, having two sets of uh, dialogue bubbles from one person. You can see Eisner trying from uh, Last Day in Vietnam, trying it without uh, the balloons. It's so similar, though. You know, like in my mind, I almost, like, like to me, I see such a little distinction. And I get it. There literally isn't a balloon and like a, a tail pointing to the speaker. But also, it's really close to what that looks like. You know, like he's he's a seeker. He's a, he's a journeyman. And, and, he's, and he's giving himself... All of his books are exercises. That's one of the yeah. things that I respect most about Will Eisner is... is it's a good lesson. Every new book that he puts out, he's, he's trying a little something. 
And uh, here's one where he's he is using typesetting. Uh, and hand lettering together. And hand lettering. And being very specific about what the typesetting is. It's it's historic. It's expository. Um, it's not like... Uh, like any kind of like inner dialogue or whatever. This is a mixed gender tag team. <laughs> I was thinking Andre the Giant and Jimmy Snuka, but I don't think that's even quite different enough. <laughs> I do love this though. I love that he would experiment this way. You yeah. know, I don't know that I would ever actually use that. Dude, Although I might, you know, I did um, a I, story and it, it featured like subways and uh, you know, that was, t I would do typeset for the signs, yeah. the subway signs, while the rest of the lettering mostly was hand lettered. I literally have an example of that. It's going to be uh, trigger warnings number two, where there is uh, the very first panel of every page is an iPhone screen yes. with type with. I think that's a great effect. Yeah. And, it, and it's the same thing. It's pretty cool to see like it's the same concept, but just applied, you know, totally differently. Yeah. That's pretty neat. They talk about Gil Kane's uh, use of type typesetting in, uh, his name is Savage, or my name is Savage, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, Black Mark, also, we have a Savage video. Go go dig it out, man. Make your own uh, conclusions. But uh, they both agree that it did not work for, for Uncle Gil. Yeah, kind of kind of fun, too, because the publisher also agreed whenever they republished it. You know, they put a different, uh, still, a, still typeset, but a different font on it. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. But it's the same deal. Like, Gil Kane's trying to make a comic that's different than everything else. This is what happens. You know, you experiment. Creative problems is the fourth section. Storygos Chandler is man mentioned a little bit. Critically, they uh, not not a fan of doing realism or fo heavy photo reference. Yeah, loses its humanity. And Miller talks about like getting more and more interested in, in Bigfoot cartooning. Yeah, citing Robert Crumb, is, uh... who they both give props to. Mm -hmm. Man, that's a lot of space but from from uh, from Chandler to Crum, from uh, Stranko's Chandler to Crum. And then uh, let's 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 bring it full circle and get into a big section where Miller's just talk about SPX and the SPX crowd of, of cartoonists who make comics because they like making comics and they're excited about the medium and it's not much uh, driven by profit motive or whatever. There's a there's a little bit of talk about the way Miller approaches cartooning cars. Yeah, and uh, it's really great because he's like, you know, if you just have the car driving down the street, it looks the same as a parked car in a comic. <laughs> right, and and he said like, my cars became characters when I got them ten feet off the ground. Yes. That's kind of like uh, a little bit that goes along with what he's saying about the idea of uh, trying to be a bridge between American comics and and uh, and manga mm -hmm. because so much of the mechanical stuff in manga is just traced like look at like Ryuichi Ikigami like sanctuary comics or whatever and you have those like Lincoln Town cars and it's all static you like look at my the psychic girl like all the vehicles and stuff they're all static because it's just completely traced from technical manuals or whatever but uh Miller's a proponent of the uh the Franklin Mint like little die cast cars man and he gets that from Jeff Darrow man Jeff Darrow sort of hipped him to all that shit. Motion is an important thing uh, in comics, in this, in this 2D medium, to just try to imply, you know, atmosphere, seasons, and the... Just putting a piece of paper in the wind implies movement, motion. Right. Uh, there's a little anecdote that Frank Miller gives about Jim Shooter telling him to stop putting floating paper in every panel. So the very next issue, Frank Miller uh, did a did a sequence that ha took place in a ticker tape parade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun to think about that atmosphere and the idea that you're trying to make sure the reader connects to what you're saying. Uh, Eisner, some of his examples are, you know, everybody knows uh, what it feels like to be cold or hot. Um, knows about little annoying things like flies and, and papers that, that are blowing around us. And it's like you can use those things because they are somewhat universal. Um, and back on the lettering kick, man. And this time talking about how important the lettering is not just to communication, but to the actual stories they're telling. Yeah. And how um, Todd Klein lettered Batman the Dark Knight Strikes Again and uh, did a gorgeous job in Miller's words. And of course he did. It's Todd Klein. <laughs> but 
it it illustrated to him it was a lesson for him that like he's got it he's got to letter his own stuff. I I I think I I feel like I see it in in Dark Knight Returns. You know, like like the standard John Costanza who is by all means extremely professional and uh, love Costanza man like those swamp thing you know I, I cite that as one of those lettering examples that I just think stands out and complements the story the art everything Great it's, the, it's the only tether in Dark Knight Returns that makes it a regular comic book you know it's John Costanza yeah. regular comic book lettering you know the inking is adventurous the, the page compositions are adventurous the coloring obviously is the one piece that's regular comic book comic iconography or whatever is the John Costanza stuff probably same deal with the uh, Dark Knight Strikes Again Mm -hmm. you know Todd Klein doing his thing and this is coming off of you know 500 pages of Sin City comics where Frank Miller's lettering his 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 own stuff we're used to that and he says basically I I have to letter everything from now on I can remember getting hold of Sin City pretty early in my comics reading and that stood out to me. Yeah, the me lettering too. is like, this is different. I'm a big fan of, uh, and a lot, of, like the old timers fucking hate it, man. Um, like rapidograph lettering. Yeah. You know, they, they, they do not like that uniform, dead kind of line. I do. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah. And I've lettered with, some of my books with rapidographs. With, with no fuss or muss, man. Like, uh, you don't need to ch- chisel it down and create like a... Dude, they would sand... The, the old uh, letters would sand their nibs right. so that you would get that like thick horizontals and thin verticals and it'd be like sanding it at an angle to do it. Um, you know, my knock on rapidographs is not the look. It's the, yeah, uh, they're, they're so fidgety. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, still to this day at mom's house, man, if you go into the little room where I used to uh, draw my comics, there are like ink splotches yep. on the wall because I threw that little bulb that you're supposed to be able to like get all this shit out of your rapidograph. I just fucking threw it in a fit of anger many times <laughs> over many years because I had to buy many rapidographs. And I swear I took good care of them. They just, they got gunked it's up. It's tough. If you don't use them all the time, man, it's that, that ink will, will st- get stuck up in there. It's such a tiny line that you're making. It's like, it doesn't take much ink to block that. This is uh, some of the stuff about um, whenever he went from the Igor shop, Will Eisner, yeah. into doing the spirit and how that was perceived by his partner as a big chance that he was taken and you know what, what's he gonna have there in a year um but pointing to the idea of even whenever he did a contract with god like you take chances you know it's how you advance it's how you move forward it's how you stay engaged it's how it, it's how life works man like you <laughs> you have to make investments yes and if you don't have to take some risk uh then you're on the hamster wheel of employment forever yeah new adventure little page from the dreamer <laughs> this comment American comics are so constipated <laughs> <laughs> yeah really th- this is where they're getting into some of that not showing the uh, graphic novel in progress to anybody I find that kind of exciting you know like now it's like I do one drawing and it's going on my Instagram I'm showing it to everybody <laughs> Miller talks about how uh, just just like the style his style of drawing changed when he got that big loft space mm-hmm. that you see in some of those like uh, YouTube uh, interview videos and stuff where he you know he has a standing desk he stands up and, and you see his hand like the the wrist action as Brendan McCarthy calls it like his hand is way down he's standing up and he was talking about like on maybe it was uh, the Batman comic or something, how he's touching 20 pages yes. in a day, putting little bits on like 20 pages in a day. And he says every every surface in the studio is art space. He's taping stuff up, like the walls are part of it. There are stacks everywhere. Like it's it's an art making factory. Yeah, it makes me want to uh, to revisit uh, Family Values. Yeah, yeah, shit, man. We're, you know we're going to ha- go through every... Uh, it's so funny to point. think of this stuff as like it's been 20 years since I've read that book, probably. Yeah. Looking at this page, man, it even it even excites me to check it out even more. Dude. I do. I love it. I love how no blacks on this character, all blacks on these characters. Yeah, it's That's a, so cool looking. It's a vestige of his like clear line mm-hmm. kind of approach with um, Electra Lives Again. Right. The pace I'm after is somewhere between American comics and manga. There it is right there. And he's referring to Batman Holy Terror, which becomes just Holy Terror? I guess. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, and Eisner says that the Japanese, uh, he couldn't sell his work to the a Japanese publisher. They said his work was too dense. Yeah. And we got into some of that whenever we've talked about, like, um, 
manga in the past. And, and things like uh, Frederick Schott talks about scanning as, as a term for reading manga because you're going so fast and you're taking in words and pictures simultaneously. Right. Which is a fun sensation on its own, but is a different experience, and at least in my experience with it. This is a funny section here, number five, sexy, because we see Pigel from uh, the, Sin- the Spirit comics. And uh, the imagery and the word implies we're going to be talking about pretty ladies. No, nah, we're talking about the sensuality of inking. And the brush. <laughs> <laughs> they love a brush. <laughs> the most erotic tool you could work with. <laughs> and mixing and mixing inks to get the proper black, mm-hmm. including blues. Did you ever hear of that? I've heard of mixing inks, but not that, not, not what he's describing. Like putting a blue into your I kind of love that. Yeah. Like I wonder like something about that pigment might make, give you a better black. Man, we read so much stuff about comics now that I never can remember quite where I'm pulling things. But they talk about like um, breaking down, composing a scene is critical, and that's why Jack Kirby thought he was a writer. In right. Eisner's words. But I had recently read, and it was about Kirby when he was running the shop, and I can't remember who who whose account this was that I was reading. But it was this idea that like something was going on, and Kirby had to ink this story for somebody to kind of like demo inking, and how he was a master of it. He never did it because like. You know, when you think of pay scale and, and where is, if you can do everything, where should your work, where should you be pointed? And it wasn't at inking, but if he needed to, he could do it. Right. It's kind of a cool story. Yeah. And in the uh, the Dark Knight Returns documentary that, that came with like uh, the cartoon, like Blu-ray, uh, there's this part where Eisner, I mean, where Miller's talking about, it takes you two years to learn to ink with a ruler and a brush. But when you do you know, your staircases are more beautiful and blah, blah, blah. He's, he gets real sexy about it. I would be very curious how many people do that today. Because I've tried that and it, it's it's doable, but man, like, you'd have to do it a lot to be able to do it fast. Two years, man. Gotta, gotta put in the, the crunch on. But isn't that everything? Like, like I think about lettering and and I think anybody could could be good at that, but it's like, will you sit down, roll out a whole piece of ledger paper and while you're watching Fresh Prince of Bel-Air in between homework, letter a whole page of just free association right. words. Because by the time you get to that last line, you're really close to perfect, like, professional hand lettering. But who's going to sit there and take the time to do that? Who's going to? You're going to. I'm going to. A lot of people who hand letter their comics are going to. But uh, the answer is always you just got to do it a lot. One of the things that interests me, I think this is the end of this chapter. One yeah. of the things that interests me a lot uh, in, in, in life, in comics outside of this book or, or this video, um, this idea of like for generations, people were drawing the way the previous generation had drawn. Yeah. And I used to say this all the time. Like everybody I knew my age, we all came up the same way. We read Marvel and DCs because that's what was available, maybe Archies or something. But we all had the same common language that we all, for the first 20 years, is what we, we had. Yeah. And then that all changes with the internet and manga and just everything. And then uh, Miller's next line is, and I think this is SPX, the kids who have been coming in recently don't give a damn how comics have been done. They're coming from a vibrant youth culture, and it's gonna, uh, we're going to get a lot stronger in terms of visual thinking. I would even contribute, like, the internet, I think, is a part of that visual thinking that we are now way different than we were 25 years ago whenever I was a kid or coming up. Um, but I think it's exciting in that, like, the gateways to comics were there were a couple of gateways whenever I was 20. Yeah. Now it really is infinite. Yeah. Like people can come in from anything. They, they can come in because they found a web comic that spoke to them or they loved some anime that got them into something that eventually leads to what we think of as comics. And coming from all these different directions, even fine artists now will go from fine art into making comics. Um, I, I just think that's kind of this amazing, that's the revolution I think in, in the last 20 years is that you've got people coming from real different areas of expertise or experience and ideas of what comics are right. and it's not spider-man anymore i think that's a good place to leave it yes. jimmy uh we are not going to be stopping the coverage of of this book uh beginning you know next time in inside the master studio it's going to be the first part of part six so k famers you know you have your marching orders man these books are going to disappear off of eBay, Amazon, and at your local comic shop. And hopefully you're lucky enough to get it for a doorbuster bargain price of $4. But Jimmy, if you're good, I'm good. Yes. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. And in so doing, mitigates the kayfabe effect. What do you got out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design. It is March, and Hulk Grand Design will be in comic stores by the end of this month. 
Uh, if you haven't ordered it already, let your local comic shop know you want a copy. They can still advance pre-order it. And uh, hopefully those are going to fly out of the print run. So do let your comic shop know about it ahead of time. And pre-order Hulk Grand Design Madness number one, which will be in shops in April. And I think pre-orders are due pretty soon, if not already. So uh, let them know you want both issues. Red Room Trigger Warnings issue number one begins March 9th, man. So it's either uh, about to come out or it has just come out, uh, depending on when you watch this video. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. And these comics are coming out on a monthly basis. Uh, every issue completely self-contained and you can read them uh, in total at my Patreon before they hit paper at uh, the link tree in the description below. Three bucks for the archive there. More than 200 pages worth of Red Room comics are available. Hit the link tree. You'll be able to get to all that stuff. What else, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below the video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below the video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Jimmy, give them the marching orders. We'll be on our way. Make more comics.